Um, so last time we talked about carbohydrates and the fact that much of the calories we get in our food uh, comes from starch and, and related carbohydrates. And this is ultimately uh, can be broken down or converted to glucose. And perhaps the single most important chemical reaction in our body is the one I've written up here. And that is that we take this glucose and we combine it, react it with oxygen and with water. And we end up producing the mass of our body, all of the other molecules. We also obviously need compounds that have nitrogen in them too, that we get from protein. But once we get adults, we are not further adding any net mass and we use our food primarily for energy. But what does that mean? What is that energy? And how do you go from glucose to energy? So we know that the basic metabolism is we breathe in oxygen and then we breathe out CO2 and we breathe out water vapor. We know that, you know, if you breathe against a piece of glass, you, you form a water vapor film. So what I wanna address is what happens to the oxygen that we breathe in biochemically? How do we use that? And the CO2 that we breathe out, where does that come from? And where does the water vapor come from? I mean, the interesting thing, we're not just re-emitting the water that we drank. Some of it comes out of our metabolism. And then the last most complicated question is, in what form is the energy that we produce when we metabolize glucose? Okay. So starches and sugars contain a lot of energy. And over the years, many people have been killed by exploding sharks in uh, starch and sugar. Uh, those of you who've grown up in the Midwest probably would hear about this once a year or so because there would be these massive explosions of grain elevators. And here's one that was captured on film you see on the left there that this grain elevator broke open and suddenly there's this cloud of grain and dust. And there must have been some spark, something nearby because it allowed some oxygen molecules to react with those sugar molecules and that produced heat, which accelerated the reaction and you can get massive explosions. So these will blow apart these huge concrete grain elevators. So obviously this is the reaction going on in our body. <laughs> we're taking glucose and we're combining it with oxygen. And what has to happen is we need to do it at a very controlled rate. Otherwise the exact same thing will happen here. It'll all just go into light and heat and we'll have an explosion. So let's follow this whole course of metabolic events that go from eating sugars to producing energy in our body. So if this is the inside of your gut, the lumen of the gut, where all your microbes are and the initial processing of some of the food, all that table sugar gets converted to glucose plus fructose. What happens next when it actually gets into our body is that our cells, our, our, our intestines rather, are lined by, are formed by, a specialized layer of cells, and they have these finger-like projections on them to amplify the surface. And on this surface, there are special proteins that bind to glucose and other small molecules and take them into the cells. And the transporters are specialized so that some are specialized for intake from the gut into the cell, and other transporters are specialized for uh, export so that as the sugars accumulate in these cells, they're transported out into the blood. And then from the blood, these dissolved sugars can go every place else in our body. A lot of it goes to our liver, that is metabolized there, but glucose especially uh, is maintained at a certain high level in the blood to provide energy for all of the cells in our body. So the next step then is that the glucose that's in the blood will 
penetrate the cell membrane because there are specific carriers that bind to that molecule and allow them to go from outside to inside. And in here, in this sort of soupy part of the cell that's not enclosed in any membrane component, <clears throat> we have the first steps of metabolism of getting energy from glucose. And I'm gonna step you through that. Here's a slide I love. <clears throat> this is sort of like the wiring diagram of the cell, if you will. So this shows the connection <clears throat> between uh, glucose. Glucose turns out to be this spot right about here. <laughs> All right. And the main point is that every dot on this diagram is an enzyme. And the enzyme takes one chemical and it converts to some other chemical. It may split it apart or put two together or just rearrange the molecules. And so you have the enzymes that are involved in, in making complex sugars. You have the enzymes involved in nucleotides. That's the ACTG and DNA and RNA. You have a whole section on lipids, fat metabolism over here. I think this diagram has, shows about a thousand reactions. And of course, in our body, we have something in the neighborhood of 15,000 of these. So this is just one page from a more complex schematic to show how you can essentially convert any molecule to almost any other molecule. All right, this is the wonders of metabolism and biochemistry. Also the bane of early students of biochemistry, because especially in the old days, biochemistry courses were kind of devoted to insisting that by the time you walked out at the end of the course, you would have memorized this diagram, which was very painful indeed. <laughs> I, I like to think that our teaching of this is a little more enlightened nowadays. We will see, because you're gonna be subjected to some of it. <clears throat> All right. So every dot on that wiring diagram of the cell refers to a specific time kind of enzyme. And last time I, I used this example to show you that enzymes are made up of proteins. They're very large molecules in that they're made up of tens of thousands or even a hundred thousand different atoms that get arranged in this very specific way such that they have an active site that is just the right size and shape to bind some specific molecule. And that molecule can go in there and, and then uh, be converted into something else. Now, for many hundreds of different kinds of enzymes, this chemical reaction <clears throat> might require some kind of extra energy input. And a typical way that that is done is there'll be another site on the enzyme that's just the right size and shape for some molecule that can undergo a chemical reaction to provide energy to actually provide some change in the shape of this molecule. And one of the ways this is done most commonly is by inserting a molecule called ATP into this site as a source of energy. And I'm gonna tell you what ATP is in a bit and show you some examples. But for now, just keep in mind that this is really one of the major functions of eating glucose is to provide the energy to make ATP, to make all of these enzymes work correctly. All right, so I'm gonna uh, sort of walk you through this morning, the main core of this whole metabolic chart, which starts with glucose, goes through a series of steps, which takes the glucose apart very slowly, step by step, such that the whole thing just doesn't explode inside each of our cells. It ends up going through this series of reactions that form a cycle. And in doing so, it generates the ATP in the form of, uh, generates energy in the form of ATP. So let's look then at the first part of this, going from glucose 
down to entry into this cycle. Before we do that, let's look at what ATP is. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So this is the adenosine part about, of it. It has what's called a nitrogenous base, kind of a flat planar molecule with nitrogen atoms in it, connected to a sugar. And if we count, there's one, two, three, four, five carbons in this sugar. And that's ribose, that's the ribose sugar. Then to this nitrogenous base, we can link three phosphate molecules. Phosphate is phosphorus element with oxygen surrounding it. And this is just a cartoon of, this, of the same molecule. Now the basic idea is, is this part of the molecule here serves as a sort of a key it has a very specific size and shape that will bind to very specific places on several hundred different kinds of enzymes. And in doing so, it brings in a little, little packet of phosphate here. And the bonds between these phosphate molecules are what we refer to as high energy bonds, such that when they are broken, energy in the form of movement or heat or light uh, can be emitted. Now, the underlying biochemistry of this is, is uh, somewhat complex in that there are, there are several components involved, including a change in entropy, which is a, a, a concept that uh, students really struggle with. But one, one that you can see pretty straightforwardly just looking at the shape of this molecule is that these phosphates have negative charges on them. Like charges repel, they push apart. So when you connect the first phosphate onto the, onto the adenosine moiety here, that goes forward rather easily. But when you put the second phosphate on, you're trying to put this negative charge next to a negative charge. And it takes energy to form this bond. I mean, as an analogy, it's kind of, they have to be pushed together until they link up. But then the energy in it is sort of analogous to taking a spring and compressing it. And if you break that bond, the spring will push them apart and that can be a form of energy. So it's a high energy bond to put the second one on. It's another high energy bond to put the third one on. And so splitting these apart will release energy. Uh, I'll show you some examples in a bit. Okay, so the goal of this whole thing is to make as much of this ATP as we can. And so we need it for many reactions in our body. <clears throat> it's been estimated that the amount of ATP just in terms of weight that we use for in a single day is about 50 pounds, 50 pounds of ATP. Now, now how can that possibly be true? <laughs> we, we don't lose 50 pounds. Well, it's because we recycle it constantly. So ATP gets synthesized, then it will bind to some enzyme and the in phosphate, or it can be both of the phosphates will come apart, come off, they will provide some energy to some chemical reaction, and you'll end up with ADP with only two phosphates. Then you need some way to put that phosphate back on to recycle it and to make ATP. And this happens every second, 24 hours a day in your body, in every cell of your body. It's estimated that you have enough ATP to keep you going for about 45 seconds, 45 seconds. And if ATP production stopped, you would die quickly. This is in fact what cyanide does. Cyanide is such a deadly poison. You just would swallow the cyanide tablet and you're dead in a minute or so. It stops the production of ATP. You use up that 45 seconds worth that you have left. There's nothing left to, among other things, fire your neurons and it, it 
leads to death. So a very important, very important process that goes on in our bodies. So let me just give you two examples. One is how do you get the energy to operate your muscles, to walk across the room, to move your hands? Well, you have fibers in your muscles. So there's, here's a muscle fiber down here and there were, this arm is attached to another muscle fiber up above. And when your muscles are operating, the two fibers are either drawn together or they're, they move apart. And what causes the fiber to move? Well, there's a molecular cable attached to one fiber that walks along the surface of the other fiber. And this requires ATP. So the blue parts of this protein are an enzyme called the myosin ATPase. It binds ATP, that changes its shape, locks it onto this fiber, and then it splits the ATP, changes its shape again, such that it comes off of the fiber and goes up bouncing around until it finds another binding site. And then it has to release that ADP, bind a new ATP, all right, do a shape change. So you get these series of shape changes, all of which are driven by the energy of this phosphate bond in ATP, and the fiber walks along there. Now, the rate at which this occurs is so much faster than what we, we could see thousands of times per second, and that's why our muscles can move very quickly. But it's really just all driven in the end by just splitting off the final phosphate in ATP to provide the energy to change the shape of this molecule so it will walk along the fiber and cause our muscles to contract. Uh, let me give you another very important example. This is, in fact, where we use the most ATP of any other reaction in our body. And that is to move sodium and potassium across the membranes of our cell. So when your neurons fire, when your brain is being active, or when you're sending some signal to a muscle to contract, the core of that is sodium that's outside of your cells will rush through a protein that's not on my diagram here, but the sodium will rush through a protein and enter the cell. And in doing so, that's plus charge. Plus charge rushes in here. And that changes the voltage across the membrane. The plus goes in and binds to these minuses inside and you get an electrical signal. That's what drives your whole nervous system. Now, once the sodium is inside here though, it's got to be moved back out to keep it at a high concentration outside, a low concentration inside. And the membranes of all of our cells have this enzyme called the sodium pump that does just that. So it opens up in the inside and binds three sodium atoms, and then it binds ATP. This is what we got here, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. After the ATP binds, the enzyme triggers a reaction where this last phosphate split is split off from the rest of the molecule. And that's like discharging a spring and the energy in that changes the shape of the pump. So it goes over to here such that now the sodiums are all facing the outside. And there's just this phosphate left here. So they will come off their binding sites and they will diffuse out. So they went from inside the cell, they bind, the ATP gets split. This cavity closes on this side, opens on this side, and the sodium goes out. And, and so uh, this reaction has been estimated to consume 45% of all the ATP in your body. So more than any other phenomena in your body, your food is used to provide energy to drive this pump so that the amount of sodium and the amount of potassium also, I'm not gonna tell you about the potassium side of it, 
are maintained at the right concentration inside the cell and outside the cell. And that is essential because that's what drives your nervous system. And it's also linked very much to the way you transport other molecules like sugar in and out of the cell. You use these sodium and potassium gradients. Uh, all right, now, before I get into that, let, let me take a, a, just a pause here. Anybody have uh, questions that they wanna raise about what's been said so far? You can unmute yourself if there's a question. Okay, well, hearing none, then I'm going to move on. Harry, I actually had a question. Um, I'm going to, wait a minute, let me, on, on video. Um, so, which, which, like, glucose, what gets used first? And if there's too much, does it get stored? Are you going to talk about that? Or, you know, what's the order in which the reactions happen? So, basically, all the other sugars ultimately get converted to glucose if they're going to be used for energy. Now, if there are more of them than are needed, then in that wiring diagram you saw, they can be converted to a lot of other different kinds of products. But the most typical one is that they can be converted into fat molecules. They, they'll, they'll form long chains of hydrocarbons in in our next lecture, it's going to be devoted to lipids. And, and so we'll talk just a little bit about how that happens. So I have a question. Yes. Will you be discussing the changes between uh, young people and older people? Or is that not part of this? Well, uh, it's interesting you bring that up because there, there's been some new things that came out just in the last year. So I think the answer is, uh, I hope to do that a little bit, yes. Yeah, it's interesting uh, uh, recent data on how our, our metabolism does change as we age. So yeah, I'll try to remember to do that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty of, of how this happens. How we use glucose to get energy in the form of ATP. Now this is pretty complex and so just, just stay with me. I'm not going to go through all of the details, but you know, the essence of it is we start out with this glucose molecule and it's a, a molecule that's got uh, um, 24 atoms in it. And um, if you added up all the electrons with all of the atoms, there's 96 electrons in this. And many of these are involved in these high energy bonds. So a function of this complex metabolism is to kind of take this molecule apart, almost electron by electron. And when these electrons go from higher energy to lower energy, you want to store some of that energy in the form of ATP. Let's set a timer for five minutes. Uh, okay, and so this is, Oh, I got one, oh, one person needs to mute themselves there. Um, so this is the essence of life. I mean, this is, this is in a way the key reaction that explains how we take food to become living active creatures. This ability to take these electrons and put them in some useful form. So I think it's really worth taking a little time to see how this happens. All right, so the first part of this is glycolysis. I'm sure a few of you have probably taken some biology in the past. This is a, another uh, kind of core set of information that students labor to understand. And some teachers will make you memorize all of the steps and all of the names. I never did that. But let's just look at the essence of what happens here. So to begin with, we have this counterintuitive phenomenon that instead of starting to make ATP with this glucose, we actually use ATP. So step one, we take a molecule of ATP and on an enzyme, the phosphate gets transferred to the glucose. So you get glucose phosphate with phosphate and the number six carbon here. The reason for this is, is it effectively activates 
make this makes this molecule more reactive. And the goal here is we want to start breaking it apart. And step one is we're going to split it into two pieces. So then we rearrange the molecule a little bit. Notice this OH becomes just O. And then we add another phosphate to the other end. And so now we got phosphate up here, phosphate here. This is a very reactive molecule. And in the next step, it breaks apart, the enzyme does, the glucose into two three carbon molecules, each of which has a phosphate attached. They're slightly different. Notice here the double bonded oxygen is on the end carbon, here it's on the middle carbon. And there's another enzyme that converts this one to this one, so that the net result is that we started with one six carbon glucose and we end up with a pair, two of these right here, each of which is carrying a phosphate. All right, then the next step is one of the complicated reactions because what happens is first of all, this molecule is able to bind just a phosphate molecule by itself. So it's already got one, but it picks up a phosphate molecule and the enzyme sticks it on the other end of the three carbons. So you got one down here, one up here. And we're ultimately going to use these very reactive phosphates to make ATP. There's a second thing that happens, and that is that we take a pair of electrons from this molecule and we transfer them onto a carrier. And this carrier is called NAD. When we talked about the McDonald's hamburger, one thing it's supplemented with is niacin. And niacin is the source of the N in NAD. It's, this NAD is going to show up again and again in this metabolic pathway because it is a used molecule for carrying high energy electrons. And ultimately, these high energy electrons are going to use, be used to make ATP. All right, so here we are. We split our glucose. We've got these phosphates on it. And now we harvest them to make ATP. The next step, one of the phosphates gets combined with ADP to make an ATP molecule. So now you got a three carbon with only one phosphate. You rearrange it a little bit. You take out a water molecule from it. You got this phosphate in a very reactive site. And now you take this phosphate and you combine it with ADP and you make another ATP. And so overall, what has happened? The glucose six carbon has been split into a pair of three carbons. You put two ATPs in, but you got a pair out here and a pair out here. So a net gain of two ATPs were made, and you've got a pair of high energy electrons being carried on as NADH molecule. So this whole process, glycol gl glucose lysis or breakage, is used by many organisms that uh, grow in the absence of oxygen. Notice there is no oxygen required for any reaction here. They use this reaction to provide the energy, to provide the ATP and provide the NADH, uh, which they can use to kind of make, make everything else. However, of the, the high energy electrons, we started out with glucose. Most of them are still in this pair of three carbon molecules we have here called, in this molecule called pyruvate. So, we want to get a lot more ATP out of these high energy electrons. And so we go to the next step in the pathway. So this glycolysis reaction takes place here in the soupy part of the cell. It ends up with these two three carbon molecules produced from glucose, and then they will be transported into this compartment called the mitochondrion. And let me show you an electron micrograph done with electron microscope that shows you the general shape and structure of a mitochondrion. Now it looks 
and is the right size to be uh, like a bacterium within the cell. And it was proposed long ago and has now been confirmed with all our recent molecular information that this is indeed the remnants, the ancestor, if you will, of a bacterial cell that invaded some early cell 1.5 billion, B, billion with a B, years ago, and has essentially been commandeered by the cell to form the ATP producing machinery that powers all eukaryotic organisms. All of those organisms that have a nuclei are powered by ATP produced in these mitochondria. Now, uh, what do they really look like? Uh, over the years, I've, I've worked with mitochondria. I'm really very much a cell biologist. And in recent years, having the new microscope technology we have, this is the organism I work with, Neurospora. And I've labeled an enzyme in the mitochondria with a green fluorescent protein. And we see that in the living cell, they really look like little worms. They're kind of dancing around in there. They're one of the most abundant things in the cell because we need, and this organism needs like every creature, you need a lot of ATP. And so what's going on in this cell is, is that the glucose that's in the outer space here is crossing the membrane of these little mitochondria and the ATP synthesis is occurring inside of them. All right, so let's go to kind of a cartoon version. Understanding this structure is important to understanding how the ATP gets made. So mitochondria has an outer membrane and then there's a space and then you encounter an inner membrane and then there's a space inside the inner membrane. And this compartmentation is the key to understanding how ATP gets made. ATP is made by an enzyme that is embedded in this inner membrane. And what happens is that protons, H plus accumulates in this space, protons are deficient in this space, and it's protons moving across the membrane that make ATP. And we're gonna look at how that happens. However, before you get to that step, when the pyruvate those three carbon molecules from glucose come in, they cross the outer membrane and they cross the inner membrane. And then in this inner space here is the next step in our metabolic sequence. So I'll show you that. So we had this three carbon molecule, pyruvate. And once it enters the mitochondria, it binds to an enzyme that does two things. One is it breaks this bond here. So that you have carbon, oxygen, oxygen, and the product is CO2. So here's where part of the sugar you eat gets converted to CO2. The other, the other two carbons are still together. So the other product is just this little two, two carbon molecule. All right. When this bond is broken, in addition, it strips off another pair of electrons. And as we saw before, uses this carrier NAD to make NADH. So the overall reaction is the three carbon molecule gets split into CO2 and a two carbon molecule. And a pair of NA electrons is on NADH and we can use that to make ATP. All right. This reaction is one of the more complex enzymatic reactions in the cell. So there are several different proteins that form three discrete enzymes that are linked together so that they can pass off intermediates in the process from one enzyme to the other. It's also an enzyme complex that requires those vitamins that we looked at when we looked at 
the Big Mac. Big Mac uses enriched flour. The flour was enriched in niacin. That's the N in NADH. The flour was enriched in thymine. That's vitamin, a, a B-type vitamin. This TPP is thymine triphosphate. It's a little, little uh, molecule that forms part of this whole complex here. It requires lipoate, that's another kind of vitamin, it required a flavin, another vitamin. So those vitamins end up as being components of some of these central pathways in energy metabolism. All right, so where, where do we stand? Now we got two carbons left. There's still a lot of energy, still high energy electrons in this remnant of our glu glucose molecule. And now we're inside the mitochondrion. And we go through the last series of uh, enzyme steps on the remnant of glucose. So our two carbon molecule comes here and goes through this cycle called the Krebs cycle. It's named after a man named Krebs <laughs> who worked this out uh, in Germany many years ago. And we, we were not go through this in the same detail we did in 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 glycolysis, but let me show you the essence of what happens here. You start out with your two carbons derived from glucose, and you put them on something that sort of functions as a carrier molecule. It's a four carbon molecule, and that makes something that has six carbons. Now, our remnants of glucose here at the end is COO. And that in the next step goes off as, well, first it, it rearranged, the molecule is slightly rearranged here. And then the COO produces CO2. And so now we've only got one carbon molecule left. And in the next step, that is removed and you produce another molecule of CO2. And both times you do this, you split the remaining glucose you take another pair of electrons and put it on NADH. You do it there, you do it here. And in the, the remaining molecule here still carries some high energy electrons that are also split off to make, this is just like a, a version of NADH. And then there's another NADH down here. And so you end up back where you started from. So overall summary, the last two carbons from glucose end up as CO2 molecules. And the electrons, the high energy electrons that were in, the, in this molecule end up on this carrier in ADH. There's also one step where you directly make another ATP right here. But for the most part, at this point, all the carbons and our sugar are gone off into CO2. And the high energy electrons are in about six different NADH molecules that we made. And we're gonna use those to make ATP. And we've produced, for every glucose that went in, we produced a pair of ATPs up in the first glycolysis cycle, and we produce another pair down here. So, so far we've made four ATPs, but we know that there's enough energy in those high energy electrons to make a lot more. All right, so now we get to the really final step where we see the synthesis of ATP. So our summary so far is glucose, which is six carbons, each of which has a water molecule attached to it, has been in cut up to produce six H2Os. The hydrogen atoms that are on this, uh, some of the hydrogen and the electrons in th those hydrogen atoms are on this high energy electron carrier in ADH. We made four ATPs, but glucose is gonna produce many more ATPs from this and nowhere, has oxygen been used? And we see that oxygen is essential to the process. 
where does the oxygen come into play? And it comes into play in the last step. Okay, so most ATP, as I said, is made in the mitochondria here. And that last cycle of events put a lot of NADH into this inner space. The NADH that had been made out here in the early glycolysis is also transported into this inner space. And so now we're gonna use it to make ATP. So here's the last diagram. This by the way is from a lesson from Khan Academy. If any of you have looked at Khan Academy, these, these, these can be quite good. I, and I like the way he did the diagram here. So this is our mitochondrion. This is the outer membrane of the mitochondrion. Here's this enclosed space between the outer and the inner membrane. And then this is the inner space within the mitochondrion. And what happens in, at some level is rather straightforward. And that is that these NADH molecules donate their electrons to a series of proteins that are pumps. Pumps in that they use the energy in the electron to pick up H plus on the inside and transport it into this space. So the first NADH binds this, you get a pair of protons bumped across. Then this electron is passed on to another pump. It's still got some energy left more protons get pumped. The electrons get passed to another pump. Protons get pumped. At this point, the electron has almost no energy left <laughs> in it. And so what molecule has such a high affinity for electrons that it's gonna take these old worn out electrons left over from the glucose molecule? And what molecule will do that? Oxygen. Oxygen has a very high affinity for electrons. And the way it makes the whole process go is to be the final acceptor, the final binder, if you will, of these electrons that were long ago in this pathway present in glucose molecules, but finally end up being accepted onto an oxygen atom. So the electron with its minus charge comes on, then H and plus will bind each of these atoms and you'll end up producing H2O. So O2, you'll get two separate oxygens, each of which will be converted into an H2O molecule. This is called metabolic water. You're actually synthesizing water. And you've probably heard about this, that there's certain desert animals, desert rats, et cetera, that <clears throat> persist without drinking almost any water. And where do they get the water to survive? They eat sugar-rich seeds. They run those seeds through their metabolic pathways and, in the in and breathe in oxygen and produce water inside their cells. There are a number of organisms that can produce a significant amount too. And we do this in our own bodies. We just don't make nearly enough to satisfy the, the water need that we have to keep ourselves fully hydrated. Partly because we're not very watertight. We just breathe out so much oxygen, water, much of which is water we drank, but some of which is water that we produced in metabolism. So what was the purpose of this whole thing? Well, the purpose was to create a highly concentrated amount of hydrogen H plus in this space. And this is used as a driving force for the final enzyme in the whole step, an enzyme called ATP synthase. This enzyme harnesses the energy when protons that are accumulating here and are all plus charge repelling each other the, to anthropomorphize, these protons want to get out of this space and they go through a turbine in this enzyme to go back to the inner part of the mitochondria. And the energy from going 
here, down here, sort of acts like a water wheel, if you will, to drive the synthesis of ATP. So during my kind of whole biology career, you know, I started as a graduate student when this was not really understood. And I've watched the development and the elaboration of this, this process over the years. It's really one of the exciting, interesting discoveries in all of biology. The guy who did this, Peter Mitchell, fascinating guy. You know, in the past, I, I've done this uh, science biographies course, and one day I want to do Peter Mitchell because it's a really great story. So let's just look at how this last enzyme works. It's one of the more fascinating enzymes in the cell. So here's that inner space where all the protons accumulated. Well, the enzyme that makes ATP has embedded in the membrane a channel through which protons can come up bind to a rotor, a protein made rotor in the membrane and cause this rotor to spin around. And as the protons get to the other side of the rotor, there's a channel that allows them to escape into the inner space of the mitochondria. So they're going from the high concentration to low concentration from a plus charge space into a minus charge space. And this gradient causes this rotor to spin. Now, the rotor is connected on top of it. It's not shown in our drawing here, but it's actually all one unit to the part that makes ATP. And I'm gonna show you that now. So now we're looking down on the top of the enzyme. So the rotor, here that's embedded in the membrane is made to turn as the sort of water wheel of protons go through it. And this red and green part of this enzyme has binding sites for ADP and phosphate. And the binding site is between the red part and the green part. So as this red part is pushed open, it opens a space in here where ATP synthesis can occur. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna rotate the enzyme. Now you're looking at it from the top. Let's look at it from the side. All right, so here's our rotor. Here's the protein that makes ATP and the active site is right here. So as the rotor comes along, it causes the enzyme to open and then ADP and phosphate go in here. It gets closed down. ATP is made, it opens up, ATP leaves and it's refilled. More as ATP is made, it opens up, ATP leaves, ADP comes in and it's refilled. So it's just a quite fascinating mechanism that it's almost mechanical, more mechanical than chemical. Uh, this rotates, this reaction occurs at a rate of about 400 per second. <clears throat> which means that in mitochondria, this rotor is spinning at a rate of 10,000 RPMs, 10,000 RPMs. And all of these enzymes lining your mitochondria, manufacturing ATP at this very high rate that you need to sustain all of these energy requiring reactions in your cell. Okay, so overall there, Glucose combines with oxygen to make CO2 and water. And the high energy electrons going from a high energy orbits in the glucose molecule to lower energy orbits, basically being uh, captured by oxygen here and oxygen here. The energy going from high to low is used to drive the synthesis of ATP. And every glucose molecule with its uh, 96 electrons in it, the energy in those is able uh, to produce 36 ATP molecules. It's a very efficient process. All right, so before I, before I go back to that, I, any questions? That's I'm going to go into a, a smaller story here about how we deal with 
a reactive oxygen in our body. But before I do that, I wanna open up this whole metabolism uh, part for questions. Any questions about this part? It's some pretty complex biochemistry. I hope you, you got the essence of it. Uh, it's so important that it's really worth spending a little time on. Any questions about any of that? Okay, Ron, you had a question. Yeah. Um, what, I may have seen a slide that's coming up, maybe not. But what food optimizes the ATP synthesize, synthesis? Well, I, so you see that it's just the starting material. So carbohydrates are, are great. I mean, this is kind of the basis of, you talk about getting a sugar high and the idea that you feed little kids candy, they're immediately high energy. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about how direct the link is there, but clearly if you take something that's just straight glucose or straight starch, it goes right into that metabolic pathway and can be very efficiently used to make ATP. Uh, on the other hand, if you had something like, you know, a high fiber diet where all the glucose molecules are covalently bound to other sugars, it takes a while to break that complex molecule into the simple sugars that will go into the metabolic pathways we saw. And so that is a slower process. You get the same yield in the end. So, so I mean, your question, what kind of food, you know, is really good for making ATP? The answer is sugar. Uh, now, next time I'm gonna talk about fat metabolism though, and, and in that complex wiring diagram I showed you, there's also a way that fat directly feeds into that. The early steps are a little more complicated. So fat is not a quick energy source because you got to take the fat apart to get simple molecule to feed into those last steps in the, that those metabolic pathways. And we'll talk about that next time. Uh, Nancy. Um. Perry, um, so energy comes from food, uh, but can energy also come from movement? The last uh, few years, I've been doing a lot of Qigong, which is basically a Chinese healing practice where you move very slowly with your breath, also being very slow. And yet at the end of doing that, you feel immensely energized. You can even feel it just buzzing in your body. And how does that happen? Where does that energy come from? You know, I, I suspect that we don't really understand that at all because it's a, it's a complex interaction of, you know, breathing and clearly oxygen is a very important part of it. This whole process is regulated by hormones that kind of upregulate or downregulate those, those metabolic pathways. Mm. So, you know, in, in, an, in, in a way it, it is, controlled by your brains that trigger this, the secretion of certain hormones that activate these processes, you know, like the fight or flight response, adrenaline. If your body has evolved to say, hey, I am in a situation where I need a lot of ATP here, <laughs> turn on those metabolic reactions. So it's, it's, it's related to that in some ways, but I think, we do really not understand it. Yeah, okay. It's, it's totally the opposite of the fight or flight. I mean, the thing is that through incredible relaxation, you get energy, which, you know, it's, there's this long tradition of calling it energy, but I really don't understand what's happening. And then you say you're not sure either. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and of course that, that what you're describing is your consciousness of your energy levels. Yes. So, you know, that in itself is a whole separate process, you know, which can, can be, you know, is directly affected by hormones, et cetera. So, huh. Yeah. No, we have, we have no good explanation for that. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, any other questions? I have a question. Yes. Here uh, is. is this process related to what we talk about when we're talking about calories, units of energy in any way? Directly. I mean, yes. Is this is this okay. is this is directly it. So so when we measure the caloric content of a food, fundamentally <clears throat> it's linked to how many ATP molecules you can get out of that food. And, and fundamentally, it's just the number of high energy electrons that are any particular food. So for example, something we'll talk about next time is fat has more calories per ounce than sugar. And why is that? Uh, but I'm gonna postpone that till next time. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, I've been listening to some podcasts recent, re recently in which uh, uh, that Dr. David Sinclair at Harvard uh, was, was speaking. He's heading up the uh, uh, aging research there. And um, uh, one of his recommendations based on his research is uh, uh, relates to certain supplements which can, can uh, uh, add energy. Um, in particular, uh, uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, when combined with resveratrol, um, taken daily, uh, as he's shown that uh, it doubles the um, level of NAD in, in as, as little as two weeks. Um, does that, uh, given the, the models that you've just shown us, uh, does that make perfect sense to you? I mean, I'm, I'm not capable of, of evaluating that. Uh, I know a little bit about that. Um... Let, let, let me just say that um, it, um, there, there are a number of people working on that. It's contentious. It, it would mm -hmm. be, it would, it, it would be approached with, with some skepticism by, by a lot of the people who, who work in that area. But I mean, we, we know little bits and pieces of, of why something like resveratrol might affect uh, metabolism. And actually doubling of the NADH levels, uh, to me, that sounds unlikely and dangerous. <laughs> mm. I mean, just, just picture that, that wiring diagram and where you have all those complex interactions. If you suddenly, uh, I mean, one of the miracles of the, of the cell, we think of how amazing biology is and how you start with an egg and develop a complex organism. To me, the most mysterious thing of all is that that whole set of 10, 15,000 metabolic reactions is largely just going on in a soup of randomly colliding molecules <laughs> that are sort of self-regulating to keep everything at the proper level. And so if you go in there and you really change the level of one of those molecules, it can kind of throw the whole thing out of, out of balance. And so that's, that's the thing I would want to understand more about uh, before I was convinced that that was right. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, so this next part is, is gonna kind of ad address your question a little bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to uh, my, I, I have another 10 minutes or so here. Uh, because something that um, comes up in uh, dietary advice is that you should eat your fruits and veggies because they're very good at providing antioxidants. <clears throat> All right. And uh, of course, the, the, the health food supplement people say, well, why don't we just sell just the antioxidants in a pill or a powder form? And so I, I want to say just a little bit about the underlying biochemistry of this. So these are all considered good foods. And so for example, here is, here is resveratrol, fairly high level in, in grapes because it's where uh, it's, its origins in wine. <clears throat> but all of these different molecules like beta carotene, which is the orange in carrots, these are all good antioxidant foods. And the epidemiology is, is pretty convincing <clears throat> that if you uh, 
have a diet enriched in these antioxidants, you have a higher uh, level of health overall. So what's the biochemistry that's going on here? I just told you that energy metabolism in our bodies is fundamentally dependent on oxygen because oxygen has such a high affinity for electrons. It's a very reactive molecule. Those grain silos explode because oxygen with just a little heating can start reacting with all the sugars that are in the dust in the grain silo. Now, the reason for this is that oxygen is normally in the form of molecular oxygen, O2. And this molecule can bind an extra electron and make something called a superoxide radical, which is, has this extra oxygen, extra electron rather, and minus charge. This is a very reactive molecule. So you don't need an enzyme to get this to combine with other molecules in the cell. It will do so spontaneously at a fairly high rate. And it's unavoidable if you live in an oxygen rich environment as we do, that you will get some of this made in your bodies all of the time. But it can bind to proteins and change the structure and activate proteins. It can bind to DNA and cause a break in the DNA. I mean, there's an, an old hypothesis that <clears throat> superoxides and oxygen damage are a key component of aging. All right. Now, because of this, all cells make enzymes whose function is to inactivate oxygen ra radicals. So, I mean, that's just good evidence there that, that, that this is toxic and it's important to keep the levels low. And so when we talk about antioxidants, the idea is that antioxidants are in some ways keeping the level of these oxygen radicals at a lower level. That's how they would help us. So vitamin E is an antioxidant. So its structure is such that if there is some oxygen radical, X just means some molecular form that's carrying a highly active electron. It can combine with vitamin E such that that highly reactive electron ends up on this part of the molecule and its structure is such that it's not just concentrated right here, but this electron's energy is sort of dissipated over the whole ring of atoms in this molecule and is thus reactive and is thus less likely to damage, to react with other molecules in your cell. So it's an antioxidant because it removes the level of these highly reactive oxygen molecules. All right, so that's probably a part of the explanation why plants have thousands of different kinds of antioxidants, many of which are the same molecules as used as pesticides. Many of these are toxins. So this was an early famous paper by Bruce Ames, professor up at UC Berkeley. And his focus of research was finding molecules that caused mutations in DNA. And one of his major findings was that plants and vegetables are loaded with molecules that cause mutations in DNA. Now, fortunately for us, they're present at pretty whole low levels. And you have this interesting phenomenon that they are both good for you and bad for you at the same time. They are highly reactive molecules that can bind these oxygen radicals and to some extent inactivate them. But at the same point, time, 
they're slightly toxic molecules in and of themselves. And so this all comes into a, being a central question topic in the question of whether antioxidants in your diet are good for you or not. So here's an experiment that people have done to examine this question of what is the effect of changing the level of oxygen radicals in your cells. So they did this with C. elegans. It's a, a nice system in which you can manipulate and mutate some of the genes, and yet you, it's a little animal in a way. And so you can see what happens if we change the amount of oxygen ra radicals. So in a normal worm, the sort of wild type worm, they will normally live for about 28 days. So they're very healthy for about 20 days and then the worms start dying. And by 30 days, most of the worms have died. That's the blue line here. They made mutant worms in which they inactivated the enzymes that keep the free radical oxygen at low levels. So if you inactivate these protective enzymes, the prediction is that the level of free radical oxygen is going to go up. All right. And so what did that do to the life expectancy? It had the very surprising results that these, these worms lived longer. They've got more of this toxic oxygen in them, but they're living longer than the normal worms. Well, so my idea by, well, maybe, maybe inactivating these enzymes didn't really increase the free radicals, but you can test for that by saying, I'm gonna take the mutant worms. They should have high levels of reactive oxygen. I'm gonna feed them with just the right amount of antioxidants and see what that effect is. And if you give them antioxidants, then they have the same life expectancy as normal worms. In other words, the free uh, radicals in here are, in, are having an effect, but they have this interesting effect of actually making the worms live longer. So how in the world do you explain this? Well, uh, part of the reason for doing this experiment was because they're interested in this question of, are vitamins good for you as a supplement? So instead of just eating carrots and broccoli, what if you just take them as a pill? And are antioxidants good for you in a pill, in a supplement form? And this is uh, from an article that was in Scientific American. And this is uh, uh, from 2007, but before doing this lecture, I, I went back into the NIH data to see if it, this is still felt to be the situation, and it is, this result appears to be valid. So a bunch of scientific researchers looked at 68 different reports of experiments measuring the effects of vitamins on longevity. And they found that in cases where the supplements had high levels of these antioxidants, beta carotene or vitamin A or vitamin E, they got the following results. In some of the studies, like the top one here, they found that the mortality rate, this is on people, uh, really was not affected by it. In other studies, they found that the people who took the antioxidant pills had a higher mortality rate, were more likely to die. In other cases, they had a lower mortality rate. There was quite a bit of noise in the data, probably due to different doses, different combinations of vitamins. But the surprising result was that on balance, among these 68 studies, there were more cases in which taking high doses of an antioxidant supplement increased your risk of death. A lot more increased risk than there were cases where the risk was lowered. And so 
this is an area of study in which, I mean, the conclusion at the moment is if you take your antioxidants in this form, <laughs> eating the plants that contain them, the epidemiology data says they are good for you. All right. And the fact that they have these antioxidants is probably part of the reason why they are good for you. But if you take them as a uh, a supplement as a pill, it may not be good for you. And so these are core, called hormetic, hormetic plant chemicals. Antioxidants are hormetic, meaning they are hormone-like. So for many toxic chemicals, if you have them at very low amounts, they have no effect but you get to some threshold where they start to having harmful effects. And the more you get of them, the more harm they cause. This is a, a, a curve for many kinds of toxins. And in fact, you know, many uh, things that we eat in our diet, things like citric acid. If, if, you, if you feed rats just tons of citric acids, it becomes toxic. You know, you can have too much of almost anything. But there are other chemicals, and the antioxidants seem to fall into this category, where at low levels, they have no effect, and then you reach some threshold where they are beneficial. And the idea here is that these are mildly toxic elements recognized that by the metabolic systems in your cells is saying toxin is present, turn on all of our protective mechanisms. So the idea is they cause a little bit of stress and a little bit of stress turns on your protective mechanisms and it protects you. That would be the explanation for why those worms lived longer. You elevated the free radicals that probably elevated various protective uh, pathways and it caused them to live longer. They were stressed, but they lived longer. Now, at some point though, these chemicals reach a dose at which adding more becomes harmful. And at some point you have a crossover, a dose where the beneficial effects are outweighed by the harmful effects and antioxidants seem to fall into this category and a few of the vitamins fall into this category. All right. So as I said before, in response to one of those questions, you know, it's good to keep in mind that all of this is going on in your body. And if, you know, somebody says, oh, this chemical here is really good for you. I think I'm going to up the dose in my diet by a hundred X. Well, what is it going to do if you've got a mix of chemicals in the cell and suddenly you have a flood into this one? Well, you're going to make a lot of this stuff over here and that may affect the metabolism of this stuff over here. It's just very complicated <clears throat> and saying something is good for you has to take into account, well, at what level, at what dose? Okay. And the best doses seem to be the doses that you find in living cells. So bottom line again is be a variety of things. And if a lot of them have a lot of color in them, they're fruits and vegetables, just from the epidemiology, that seems to be the best thing you can do for, for your diet. And we understand a bit of the underlying reasons, but it's a lot more complicated uh, than we, fully understand at the moment. All right, any, any further questions? Further questions about any of that? All right, let me go into gallery view here so I can see everybody. All right. So you see if this were a biochemistry class, you, you would just know that some of the questions were gonna be, uh, what enzyme in the glycolysis step way converts a six carbon sugar to a three carbon sugar? And it would re require going back and looking at your notes a little bit there. <clears throat> okay. <laughs>
All right. Okay. Well, if no questions, I have I have one. Okay, actually. Ron. Yeah. Um, sort of a light question. Uh, in the credits to your presentation, can we say that no worms were injured in the making of this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid you cannot say that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Although apparently we increased the longevity of some worms, but were they happier worms for it? We don't really know. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nancy? Oh, okay. That's an old thing. This is fantastic because so many times you read about these health studies and something is really good for you. And then the next study says it's not good for you. And then I remember I had this cartoon that I cut out of a magazine, a New Yorker a, a long time ago where this fairy godmother is coming to the table where this family is eating dinner. And the fairy godmother waves her wine and she says, everything that was bad for you is now good for you. <laughs> yes. But yes this, is so, this is so common. But this explanation of that curve that actually there's just a little bit can be good for you and then it drops mm -hmm. is just so revealing of why these studies are coming out differently. And I so appreciate this explanation because that... You know, it was very hard to take seriously these biological studies about what's good for you and what's bad for you. Mm -hmm. So your explanation was, I don't even have a question. I just want to say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you got the point because <clears throat> that is the point is you can, you can see how, how complicated it is and how difficult it is to predict not only what something will do, but what the level of something will do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Harriet, and then... Okay, and then Ag Agatha, Agatha. Okay. Yeah, not a question, just, it's just beyond belief and understanding what you showed us this morning. I mean, it's, yeah, just way beyond what I thought we were gonna be looking at. <laughs> I had no idea that all that has to happen for us to just live and breathe and be. Yeah, I just mean, think of- how, how could it be? <laughs> all your little mitochondria with their little motors whirring away there. <laughs> The and other thing, RPM. Yeah, one, one more thing is that I was reading a, the gene, um, an intimate history. Yes. Yeah. And to learn that the mitochondria is passed by through the female line only. So that's a whole other interesting aspect of this. That's so right. It's not come in the sperm, it's in the egg. So yeah, that, that was very interesting. Yeah, you're right about that. Yep. Get all our mitochondria from our mothers. Yep. Harriet? I think, I think all, uh, oh. okay. all doctor, every doctor, okay, <laughs> every doctor should follow uh, this science because it's come new and new understanding. <laughs> well, that's, so my, my colleagues in medical schools are often frustrated that their, pre, their medical students are not very interested in the biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> it's complicated, but they give us advice what vitamins and how much we can take. But I found that one do I doctor recommended me a lot of vitamin E and so on, but my retinal doctor said I don't need so much. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> they, they think differently and they have to follow science, how it goes for more and more understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Equally complicated and important and interesting. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you, Barry. Do you take any? Do you take any supplements? Do I take any supplements? I I, I do not. I mean, I uh, uh, like most men. I take a statin, you know, and uh, and you know, I gave that example of how ATP is largely used to drive our sodium pumps 
probably the second most prescribed drug in the world are things that affect our blood pressure, which are affecting the sodium balance. And I, I take a blood pressure pill, but no, but my wife, Rusty, is very good about making me eat my vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's useful. Ron? Yeah, um, you uh, showed us that the study or where they looked at 68 different studies mm -hmm. and uh, in, in the conglomerate, all of the supplements that they were taking were on the side of, of um, it doesn't help. But what about if you were to look at, okay, all of the studies that talked about vitamin C, did vitamin C help? Uh, maybe vitamin D didn't. And so that when you averaged them out, it you said it didn't help. But I was wondering, did they by chance go through the 68 studies and look by the supplement? Well, the, the major conclusion in that one was that there was a correlation that the, the vitamin supplements that seemed to be giving the highest rates of mortality that were the worst for you were the ones that were enriched in these antioxidants. And, and so they mentioned the three, the beta carotene, or vitamin E, and I don't remember the other one. So, yeah, but, but you know, it, it shows that the data were very noisy. And so, you know, it's really hard to draw a, a hard conclusion from it. But, but I think the conclusion that some of these in excess should be avoided, I think that's a pretty legitimate conclusion. And as I said, that since in the, you know, the 15 years since that study was done, it continues to support that conclusion. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, next, next uh, time, folks, one of our favorite of all molecules, fat. So why do we like it? Why is it good for us or not good for us? Why does it have high calories? And we'll talk about lipid metabolism next time. Okay, see you all in a week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.